Hey, everybody. So it's going to take a couple of seconds for people. Hey, I guess not. Everybody's <laughs> already here. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. We got a notification. We just went live. Um, my, for those that may be new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center, and I'm here with returning guests, Dr. Everybody. Deb Jones. Hello. Good morning. Um, so you... Um, well, let me just give the introduction real quick. Um, for those that are new, um, this is another episode of Coffee with the Critters where we go live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, we, I am the owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world through our live streaming services about empowering the lives of the animals and ourselves through using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis. So now back to, let's see, we can get this off of here because uh, now back to, yeah. So returning guests. I feel really short here. Well, it's because we're on two different chairs. I know, the tall person is in the tall chair. I like this chair better. (laughs) Short person is in the short chair. We planned well. Yes. (laughs) And we have our co-host, Rico. Is he up there? In the back. Okay. He's going to be stationing on your head here shortly. (laughs) See if I can get in the right spot. There you go. Uh, uh, (laughs) We moved. We quit moving. (laughs) Um, So this is, you've been live with us. This is like this like third or fourth fourth, time? That's what I was going to say, third or fourth time. I'm guessing that I've been here. Yeah. We've we've done this a time or two now. Uh Not that we've gotten any better at it. (laughs) I think so. Well, at least we know what to expect. We've done less planning. Yeah, and now they all agree. Because the energy is starting in the room, so we'll oh, respond to it. That's very good. Yeah, it's interesting. Because my dogs know when you're taking a video, and they're like, oh, she did something. And I think the birds, with this setup, they pick it up right away. Like, yeah. Oh, something different is going on. When we start laughing, like my whole oh. coffee with the critters last week. I was very monotone, very, I was being negatively reinforced to talk low, to escape the board. Okay. Uh-huh. They're training you quite well. Yes. They're good at it. They are. Much better at it than we are. <laughs> oh, even, even Quincy started. <laughs> even Quincy started somehow. Let me see Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hi. <laughs> hey, everybody. So, yeah, um, Deb, w- before we get started, um, Deb is a retired psychology professor. Yes, retired, retired. is the important part here. Retired, which makes me very happy. And you were talking yesterday, you're working harder than ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this retirement thing has not worked out quite the way I thought it would. Well, I knew I would do more training stuff. That was kind of my goal. I'm not anywhere close to not wanting to do anything. That would be really good. So I figured I'd do more animal training, uh, but I've kind of been stunned by how busy I've been and how many new projects, because now it's like, oh, I can take on every new project that I have an idea about or that sounds good, and I've got to focus on a few things and stop trying to do everything. It's, yeah, and I know a lot of, a lot of trainers know this when you're working for yourself. Um, it's harder to say no to stuff, but I'm trying to focus more precisely on the things that I really, really want to do and try to avoid things. I could let go. That's a hard thing. Yeah, I'll get the balance maybe. Not this year, but I'll get the balance. <laughs> yeah, go on. yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, retired from uh, teaching college, but definitely not retired from teaching college. Correct. And people. And people. <laughs> yeah. So, um, before we get started, um, Deb and I are going to be talking about what was it? Communication, choice, and care. Right. It took us forever to come up with that. <laughs> Communication, choice, care. Yes, there's three basic topics. <laughs> so we're going to get started talking about that, but I want to address a few things before we get going. It's kind of dark in here this morning due to, uh, it looks like it's getting ready to storm. Yeah. And the time change. Yes. So um, a couple of things I want to address before we get started. Um, many of you may have known... Um, we there's been several changes that have happened this past week um some planned some not planned um we lost our dear sweet sam 
and I'm not going to go into detail about that. All the information is here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. Um, we received a lot overwhelming response from you guys, and we appreciate it so much. I am here to tell you um, we do have some things in the works to um, what, like a, a, a fund or something to go in the honor of, of Sam as far as education <clears throat> and wanting to do, bit, do better. Um, so stay tuned. We are putting something together. We will have something for you this week. Um, so also in two weeks from yesterday, I believe it is, um, I'll be giving a, um, a workshop at St. Xavier University um, in Chicago. Um, my second year, I'll be co-lecturing with um, Dr. Jason Crean in his zoo genetics and biology course. Um, but we're opening up the workshop to the four hour workshop on Saturday to the public. Um, so the contact information is there. Uh, contact Jason Crean, and then stay tuned because Rocky's Rocky's commercial. Oh. It's not his commercial. It's it some, sort of is. <laughs> it's turned into Rocky's commercial. <laughs> it is, exactly. We'll be airing in less than two weeks, and we um, are making arrangements to do a Coffee with the Critters with the producers here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. Okay. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of lots of stuff happening. Lots of stuff going on. He's Rocky, such a rock star. He lots is. Yeah. He is. He's got quite the story too. So <laughs> here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to pay attention to some of your comments. <clears throat> okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So Deb and I have done at least three to four coffee with the critters. <laughs> yes. We'll and go with that. yep. And last year we did for the first time. Ever a, a, um, a joint workshop yes. here? That was fun. Yep. Oh my gosh. That yeah, that fun. sold out, and we're planning on doing it again. We are, and you already have people who've signed up for it. I do, and they don't even know what we're doing. I know. We didn't know until yesterday, <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, we had. I thought it um, was a lot of fun last year. It, you know, and it we was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was very interactive. It was, and I think we we. You know, try to work out how much you know we talk, how much they work with animals and with each other. You know, kind of get that balance right and figure out how everybody can get the most out of it. Yeah. So that you know, I think we'll we'll do even better this year because we now have at least some idea of how it's going to go. You know, and of course, what I did, which is what I do for everything, is I planned way too much to fit <laughs> into the time frame. Well, at least we knew right. Going to run out of information. Well, yeah, that's my biggest fear, I think, as a teacher and presenter, is that I'm just going to have nothing to say. And I don't know why that's such a big fear, because it's never happened. But I'm always, that's like the thing that worries me. So I over prepare stuff. And then that's fine. You have a lot that you don't need to use. I'd much rather have that. Yeah. Then you know the other option, but especially if I'm with you, you always have stuff to say, <laughs> and that's never going to be a problem. And we work well together because you pre-plan a lot, and I'm kind of like I'm all right with, you know what? Mm -hmm. I changed my mind. Let's do this instead. Exactly. Um, and I'm fine with being flexible, but first I have to have the plan. Yeah. You know, except for something like this, which clearly we just went into being totally flexible today. But when yeah, when I'm doing a weekend or a workshop or something, I always think that's my strength is that I'm organized and I plan step by step by step. That's my strength as a trainer. But then if you're too rigid, that becomes a problem too. So there has to be that middle ground where I can have all the plans in the world, but then I go, oh, that's not what I need to do right now. And yeah. I need to change really, really quickly. And it's true with animals all the time. Yeah. If you try to stick to your plan, they may not They may have like a different plan. plan. <laughs> exactly. They and may not go along with that. That's what I like to do. Um, like when I give presentations and workshops, I will tell everybody, all right, I have slides prepared, but mm -hmm. I'm going to do whatever this I'll let you shape whatever we do right so if I see somebody having a problem with timing I'll stop and we'll work on usually with Milo Everybody or a bird. has a problem with timing yeah <laughs> but, but yeah we talked yesterday um, about the variety of different animals we're going to use in this workshop yes, yes. and that's always my favorite part um, because 
wild dogs have been my main species for 20 some years. I love the opportunity to see and learn about any other species. I think they're all fascinating. Um, some of them I may not want to be hands on with yeah. because they scare me a little bit, but I still want to see somebody train them. So I like to watch you train them. If it's an animal that I'm like, I'm not sure. Um, well, as I was when I first came here and I wasn't sure about birds. I'm like, I'm not sure that I really like them, but I'm fascinated by them and they're a little scary. Um, but I still wanted to learn more yeah. and to be around them and to see how they're trained. So I think that's, you can learn so much from a species other than the one that you normally work with. There's just no question in my mind. Yep. I um, had the opportunity to visit a friend when I was down in Asheville a month or so ago who has horses and goats and chickens and some other things. Hi, Trish, I know. You might not be here, but hi, Trish. Um, and um, I got to train the goats once, which was interesting and fun because the way they take treats is very gentle. Yeah, we were talking about this last night. Which stunned me yeah. because I expected something totally different. And then another time I got to work with the horses. And with the horses, you have to watch, you have to be very careful how you feed because you don't want them pushing at you to try to get the food. You don't want them to become grabby and demanding because you can really get hurt with that. Yet you're still feeding from your hand. So it's a whole different world of how you provide reinforcers, which I thought was really interesting. So just little things like that to me yeah. are really fascinating how this species is different than another, even though in the big picture, we all learn the same way. They all learn the same way. Very which good. can um, kind of bring us into <laughs> Um, are talking about communication. Right. Um, and I had never planned on growing up to be a professional animal trainer, <laughs> but I saw that how powerful it can be. And um, training is teaching. Teaching is learning. All of those are communication. Yes. Um, and depending yes. on how you communicate with that animal is going to determine how that animal behaves, responds, mm -hmm. it is. future rates of behavior. It, 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 yeah, it is. And I think when we started talking about communication yesterday and I started thinking about it a little bit, um, the fact is that lots of trainers think communication is a, a one-way street. They communicate with the animal and they teach the animal what they want it to do and they put it on cue. But that's only half of the interaction. And if you're not open to what the animal is telling you in return, and if you don't figure out how to listen to what they're saying and how to interpret what they're saying, because sometimes that's the big thing. I know what they're doing, but what does that mean? You know, And not ignore a lot of subtle signs that they're trying to communicate back with us. And I sure. think that's the part where a lot of trainers have sort of ignored that. It's like, I'm going to teach this animal to do this thing. And when I say sit, my dog's going to sit. Okay, but there's a lot more that we're missing out when we start to talk about communication. And the more I look at body language in animals in particular. Yeah, and, and um, that body language is behavior. Um, mm -hmm. That is, um, if you don't accurately read that behavior, you can likely punish the very behavior you're trying to train. Right. Or in some of the animals that I work with, your life is going to be in danger. Well, yeah, that's kind of a big motivation to pay attention to the animal. We get away with a lot with dogs because in general, you know, so but in general, they put up with a lot of sloppiness and nonsense and they at worst will go away and not want to work with you. Um, though, you know, then occasionally you get that case where you get hurt, but those are pretty rare with dogs. But if you try to do some of the things with other species that we do with dogs, putting pressure on, trying to coerce them, not giving them options to get out of a situation, um, those other species are not going to react kindly. They're not going to be. Yeah. yeah. It, there's, you know, um, when you're training something behind cage bars that has, and this is something else we're going to talk about choice. They mm -hmm. have less options. Yeah. Um, that's true. You know, and, doesn't matter if they're predator or prey, you're likely going to get hurt. Yeah. And if you can't accurately read that behavior, um, 
you're going to you're going to make some mistakes and you're going to have some counter conditioning to do which you want to try to avoid <laughs> exactly you yeah. know we're uh, just digging a big hole for ourselves yeah. in terms of training that then we have to try to get out of that you could have possibly avoided if you'd been more aware of that animal and what they're trying to tell you and um, just before you move on, can you hold that thought? Because yeah. people are asking about the workshop. I'll lose that thought, but okay. We'll come um, back later. <laughs> well, no, no problem. The seats have already started selling. Um, <laughs> if you're serious about joint, uh, attending, you might <laughs> want to take a look. And I'll show you a link at the end of the um, presentation. Um, and we have people that are returning from last year, yes. so that's a compliment. That is. I'm excited about that. Yep. And we have brand new stuff for you. Yes, we do, and we are going to make sure you learn. Um, but what we were talking about, communication, choice, um, a couple of things I wanted to say, and, and I found myself in this situation where I am just like, I wasn't expecting this. I made a mistake. Yeah. I'm getting ready to make another mistake. Just stop <laughs> before you make any more. Right. We, it's, I mean, well, we learn from, hi, Quincy. Oh, hello, Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about communication. Hello, Quincy. We hello, learn Quincy. from those <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> yes, and we do. Let's be at least comfortable if you're going to be a man. She's like, okay, thanks. thanks. And I don't even want to ask how much she weighs, but she's a heavy girl. 96. Oh, okay. That's all. <laughs> But if I find myself, I don't put myself in situations where, yeah, Daphne, we're looking forward to working with oh you and meeting you in person finally. Um, if I find myself where I'm not sure what the animal is saying or doing, uh -huh. um, that's usually when I back up to something where I do understand. And like one of the things I'll do is target train with a stick. Mm -hmm. Um and then I'm watching all those behaviors, the facial behaviors, how they're right. moving their arms, their legs, their wings, their whatever, their feathers. And what is that correlated with? Yeah, I think that's that's smart because at least with target training, you get you can gain a little distance and perspective, and that gives you a chance to observe more. So if you're right up close training the animal right in their face, I think we miss a lot of, yeah. of what's going on with their body language and what they might be telling us. Yeah, so, like what are their back legs doing? Are they getting prepared for escape? Right. You know? <laughs> Things that we need to know. And I, I think I told you one point a long time ago, or maybe it wasn't that long ago, um, when, I, when I'm in doubt, I tend to just freeze. I just stop what I'm doing and go, okay, what do I need to do next? And you said that would work really well unless you're working with Willie, because you don't want to just stand still around a turkey vulture. Yeah, when you stand still around a turkey vulture, you look they're looking at you like, like are Mom, you still alive? Are, are you, you my next one? snack? Exactly. It's like, so don't go with that if, uh, around Willie. Do you um, want me to get her off your lap? She's fine. She'll go when she's ready. Okay. She's such a sweetheart. She's she a is a very lady. good girl. She says, I am. I want to be on Facebook Live with everybody else. <laughs> she thinks she's pretty special being out here, I think, all on her own. Uh -huh. She's, she's like, like, no snow, me. no Levi. It's exactly. all about me today. Just don't let Rico hear you say that. Oh, no. Absolutely not. Um, so a couple people had questions. I'm going back okay. and looking through. Um, so Quentin says um, that is his issue sometimes is what does this mean you Mine know too. and if if you I mean do you want to address that um, well when I don't know what it depends on the species of course because with dogs I think I have a pretty good idea of what most of their body language means but everybody's an individual and sometimes <laughs> Deb, you have a treat in, in your right ear. Here. I believe those ears are keen. I believe they Do you are. want me to get her down? Yeah, we're going to. Okay. okay. Oh, there you go. Good girl. Just so I can talk without a... There you go. She's such a sweet dog. I do love her. But anyway, I um, when I'm here working with Laura's animals or when I'm with, with another trainer and I'm, I'm getting a chance to work with their animals, I just ask them i mean i follow their lead what does this mean tell me and i do that a lot with the birds because i really don't feel like i have a good feel for their body language i can see something happening and i'm like okay why is he fluffing up all those feathers around his face and i'm sure there's a name for that thing that they do but i'm like does that mean he's happy does that mean he's 
unhappy or what? I think with Rocky yesterday, he's getting definitely excited and happy and aroused. <laughs> but at what point is it going over the edge? Yes. And are we pushing him into? Nice job, Rico. I'm just reinforcing. Oh, what a good boy! Yes. Yay. Nice job. <laughs> so I'm always trying to gauge that level of energy and excitement, and when does it hit a tipping point and go into something dangerous? Because I think in any animal, there's a point when it's just overwhelming to them. Whatever, whatever they're feeling, and we need to stop before we push them too far. Too far, yeah. like we were talking about that yesterday. When you, I can't remember what it was, and it, <laughs> I was like, he's getting overexcited. Yeah, he's getting overstimulated. Yeah, well, he was, yeah, because he was on my arm for a while, and he really seems to like that. And then we got him on the perch, and he was going to town. He was running back and forth and, and carrying on, and. It's like, is he just having a good time or is this getting to the point where he's getting overloaded? With yeah. 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 And that's really common with several species of parrots. You can get them to the point of overstimulation where bam, you get Yeah. Bit. Yeah. And I, uh, we, we keep trying to read animal behavior through our human lens. And so for me as a human, what, what I naturally want to do with an animal is often the absolute wrong thing to do. Because I want to get want to right in their faces things. and kiss them. And that, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> with yeah. any animal, really, until you know them very, very, very well. And yeah. even then be careful because they're animals. Things can happen. And with, we were talking about yeah. some of this last night, which was some pretty good conversation um, about a dog is still a dog. Yes. Yeah. No matter how domesticated they are, they're not babies. I'm sorry, those of you who think your dogs are your babies. But yeah, kind of we were talking about this blog that I've been I'm gonna be working on for a while on what really is a dog? Because it's different to different people and the way we perceive them is the way we treat them, but that then changes their behavior. And we're not necessarily letting them be a dog anymore. We're trying to force them into a mold of being something that we would like them to be, something different than what their real nature is. Um, so we don't appreciate the animal. The dogness. Right. Yeah, or the birdness. The or birdness. whatever it is. It's like we want I want you to be what you are, but now I want you to be what I want you to be. Right. And there's where we're gonna get into a lot of trouble. And that's extremely I know we're talking a lot about dogs and parrots, but mm -hmm. I'm just trying to pick companion on this side. Right. You're covering the dogs with the parrots. Right. Um uh, a lot of people want to, when their parrot is scared, hold in comfort where that parrot's behaviors is to get the hell out of here real fast. Go. I need to, I need to and they, leave and And we fly. need to give them that opportunity. That, and if you don't do that. Oh, then the, the only thing left is to fight. Yeah. And then we're going to get hurt. And then we're going to be upset and our relationship with our animal is going to be damaged because how could you bite me? Or how could you hurt me? You know, why don't you want my love? Right. <laughs> it's like right. Your love is not, um, it's not love to the animal. It's something unpleasant that's happening to them. Yeah. You know? So let that bird have yeah. its birdness. Right. And the right. dog have its dogness. Exactly. And whatever, I, I think what I always like, what I first got into animals in general or in animal training was I like the relationship you can develop with an animal. And this the, the level of understanding that you can develop with an animal, but we can't ever assume that they have that somehow that has made them not an animal anymore. Right. So we can't anthropomorphize. I always have trouble saying that word. We can't anthropomorphize and start to to attribute human characteristics to them, no matter how much they seem human. I mean, um, one of my dogs, Star, a black and white border collie. She is so sensitive to my moods that if I like breathe, these two, she's right there. Like, oh my gosh, is something wrong with you? And she's like right on top of me, almost insisting if she thinks I'm upset that I pay attention to her, um, which can be annoying. But at the same time, it's awfully sweet because it's like I care so much about your mood. Sure, but I want to change it. They're right? so this, in tune yeah, with your behavior. But then I can't assume that Star is acting like a human. She's still a dog. Sure. As much as she seems to kind of be a natural 
for being like an emotional support animal. Apparently she's my natural emotional support animal. She's still a dog and she still does dog things and she still chases squirrels when I don't want her to chase squirrels. And I, that's stuff that, that we try to keep in mind that what they are is what part of why we love them. And if we're trying to make them human, we're not doing them any favors for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, it's not fair to the animal. Right. Definitely not fair to the animal. And, um, you know, anthropomorphism, putting human characteristics on animals. Um, you do that in the zoo community, you're going to get yourself. Hurt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whenever I hear about people who have adopted exotic animals or who have taken them into their home, and I'm sure you feel the same way, it's like, oh, no, please don't do that. Because usually, they're treating the animal in a way that's not appropriate for that species. And they're expecting or wanting the animal to be something that it's just not going to be. Sure. You know, you kind of like, yeah. like people like bringing in wolves and treating them like dogs. Right. And it's like, that's not going to be good for either of you. It's definitely not good for the wolf. Yeah. I've not seen a wolf that's happy as a being treated as a domestic pet, you know, and it's not good for the person. You know, there's, um, Weird reasons why people take, want to take in animals, or there are reasons I think why people want to take in animals that are normally not pets and try to make them pets, but I don't think those are valid. I don't think they're good reasons. You hear it a lot with primates. Somebody wants, you know, they're a primate. They're like, yeah, so we take in them a spider monkey or a capuchin monkey or whatever the case is. And wow, they, they're not acting very civilized at all when they hit adulthood, when they hit maturity. It's like, well, you know what? They, that's what they are. Sure. They were never meant to live with you in your house. And to wear diapers and sleep in bed. Right. Yeah. Right. Kind of, you, kind of like the case, wasn't that here in Ohio several years ago, where the woman um, had some kind of monkey and it wore diapers and it ended up attacking her best friend and destroying her face? Yeah, I think that might have been in, I don't know that that was in Ohio, but I remember a bit about that case. And I think it was a male chimpanzee. Was it? And when they hit maturity, you know, they're they're not easy to manage or handle. They're not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be a pet. Right. You know? so, and that's kind of something we're talking about in level two, um, evolution of domestication. Yes. Yeah. That's that's very interesting. The book we're re we were reading and talking about how to tame a fox. And I, I don't remember the author, but the name of the book is How to Tame a Fox. Dude, Mila is true, one of true. Mila it's on true. my phone. Okay. Yeah, mine too. Because God forbid we read it, we're listening to it. Um, but it's about the um, Belayev. I always have trouble with that name too. Belayev, the Russian fox experiments, and how they are working on domesticating foxes. But no matter how much you domesticate foxes, they're still foxes. And there's, you know, you can't make a fox a dog, even though that's sort of what they say. I haven't finished the book yet, so. Yeah, I, I don't think they ever proved that you could actually do that. You can make them into tamer foxes, but they're still foxes. And there are differences from domestic dogs, and they're always going to be. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Minor interruption, because if, if I address it, it'll save our ears. Oh, well, then definitely address it. <laughs> We're pretty good at just look, just waiting till it's over. Chuckle. Wow. Right. Such a goofball. So with talking about communication and... Um, choice the type of work that we do a big part of the type of the work that we do with animals is offer choice do right. you have a choice right. in this as much as possible and i think it's a lot like dealing with the two-year-old human you can't if you give them free choice to do whatever they want they're going to make really really poor decisions and get into trouble very quickly but if you Hi. sort of structure their choices but still give them choices then that's typically going to make them happy, make us happier. So they get to make some decisions. If you tell somebody all the time, first you'll do this, then you'll do that, then you'll do the next thing, and you just keep giving them no options, they're going to get sick of that pretty quickly. Um, so we want to be careful about that with animals as well, and especially animals that we make every decision for them about everything in their lives. You know, I decide when my dogs eat. I decide what they eat. I decide when they leave the house. I decide what we do when they leave the house. They, they've got 
no real decision making <clears throat> in the majority of this. I decide when I'm going to tell them to do certain behaviors. So when it's possible, and there are ways to, um, to, to handle either decision. So do you want to train now or do you not? It doesn't matter to me. You make that decision. And if you don't want to, people are often worried that then their dog's going to say, no, I don't want to train with you. But honestly, if the dog says, no, I don't want to, then I've got some really good information. Why don't you want to? What's going on? What could I change? What do I need to do differently? So it's not that my dog doesn't love me because he doesn't want to train right now. It's my dog is telling me something important here. And if I keep pushing him to train, maybe there's something really wrong. And I need to address it. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, when we were talking about this right before we got started with Coffee with the Critters, um, the dogs here, when they know they're going to get trained, because I give different cues that happen <laughs> at no other time, but when I'm getting ready to train, um, you'll see them all line up in a row, get ready, and just really looking oh, yeah. forward to um, the training session, not only because... Uh, because there's choice involved, there's correct identification of positive reinforcers, um, there's engagement, social enrichment. Right. Yeah. Um, it's mentally and physically stimulating to them. It's giving them jobs to do. Right. Problems yes. to solve. And they need that. It's life has to be pretty boring if you're a smart creature who is left with nothing to do most of the time. So what happens, what happens with most domestic dogs is they find things to do. And then we're very unhappy about those things. Um, but a big part of that we sort of talked about, in, we were talking a little bit about enrichment yesterday, about boredom in animals. Um, and we can't, if we're taking these animals in and we're taking responsibility for them, we need to give them things to do. We need to give them appropriate challenges. And to me, training, you always say training is a favorite form of enrichment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got that right. I've heard that a time or two. Mm -hmm. um, it's sure, at least it should be. And I agree with that. If, my, if I say you guys ready to train and all the dogs don't jump up and go, yes, we're ready right now, my training is not optimal. I'm doing something wrong. Because I want it to be a big highlight to their day. I want it to challenge them. It's not just about getting cookies because that's only a small part of what we're doing here. It's about our interaction. It's about them using their brains to solve puzzles and problems and about me being a good enough trainer to be clear and not frustrate them. All right, so if training's frustrating or unclear, then they don't like it and they want to opt out. Yeah, and um, in my presentation in Montreal, um, <clears throat> we were talking about, I mean, that a lot of that presentation was about abnormal repetitive behaviors. Those develop, they're so common with exotic animals in enclosures, and it's usually due to stagnant, unstimulating environments. Oh, yeah. I think zoos have gotten so much better. Yeah. Um, many facilities have gotten so much better about the environments and the enrichment than they ever used to be. Oh, oh yeah. And if, if you're not... People are being shamed into doing different. <laughs> Which is that's <clears throat> kind of a good use for it. I yeah. Think. If you're going to shame somebody. Well, a lot of times people don't. Sorry, I'm off camera. <laughs> you're a, we're like so far apart, <laughs> like we can't sit next to each other here. People don't understand what stress looks like. A lot, pe yep, a lot of people have a hard time trying to identify stress. That's true. And sometimes, again, knowing the species is important. What's the hey. normal behavior? How is this different? And then what does this mean? For, I'm going to reinforce this. I'm okay, still listening. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just talk to them. I don't okay. need to talk to you. You know all this stuff already. <laughs> it's like if my dog's is, I'm in the middle of training and my dog starts scratching. They take their back foot and start scratching behind the ear. What does that mean? Could mean they have an itch. Okay. So that's a normal thing. It's to scratch if you have an itch. But what if they keep doing it repeatedly? What if it becomes a pattern of every time I train, they scratch, and they don't scratch any other time? Now I'm looking at an ab a normal behavior that in this context becomes abnormal because it's happening way too often. And that it should be telling me something instead of me ignoring it or going, wow, he's itchy, ha, ha, ha. It's like, no, there's something going on. The same with yawning something, dogs. Yeah. See that. That's another behavior that is often an indicator of stress. Yes, dogs yawn. We all yawn. But if they start doing it in a regular pattern whenever you're trying to work with them, then I'm going, what are you doing? Right. Why is and it's paired with something. 
-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and it can go a couple different ways. Like I know in level two, when I know Pat Anderson's <laughs> on here, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I was training that monkey, the Mona Ganon. And oh, when yeah. I first started training, he would, he'd start doing this. Oh, actually, okay. And I'm just like, all what right, that that's happened <laughs> twice now. And each time mm -hmm. I walk up to her to train her, she starts doing it again. But it ended up turning out um, through observation and feedback from, it ended up being uh, like something she was looking forward to. It was like an excitement and yeah. anticipation behavior. Yeah. But I mean, stress in, for example, a prep um, could be just a sign of stress, could be standing up and stretching that wing. Wow. Um, I would not have this, known that. Yep. And that could be something else, too. That could also be I just finished resting for a period of time. I'm getting ready to take off in flight. Yeah, um, okay. But this it could also be um, this is a stressful environment, and I'm staying focused for so long and like hyper aware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a way to kind of help relieve, relieve some, some of that of, stress. Yeah, I think most of most of those things are ways that they're trying to relieve stress somehow, and it then just becomes a habit when I start to feel stressed to do whatever this thing is that I normally do, but we should be watching that. And if I see an animal getting to that point, they need a break yeah, right away. And I need to think about what I'm doing because I'm doing something wrong. There's, there's something I'm doing that's causing that to happen. Well, based on what you just said, um, you take a break. I watch what those animals do at the end of a training session, like, are they doing things like, like relieved that the training session is over? I'm watching their behavior, how they act afterwards. Right. Or if they're like constantly checking in, waiting for you to call them back into a training session. Yeah, because I really don't want them to be happy that the session is over. That says to me there's something that I was doing that was a problem, because again, I want them to be to enjoy being in the training session. And I, we see this sometimes with dogs that actually the end of a training session becomes stressful. They don't want it to end. And so it's a punishment to end the session. And then, you know, you'll see that, that behavior, you'll see behaviors at the end of a session. Like I want them to still want to be interested, but I don't want them to like get upset or frantic or, you know, overly attention seeking or whatever the case might be. So then we have to think about, well, how can I get out of a session gracefully? Sure. And how can I end it so my dog is not really disappointed that it ends, but they transition into other activities. Pip squeak, what are you doing? Looking at Rico because he was up here He's saying down hi, down and I stopped delivering reinforcers. And now he's down here, like, excuse me, people. So he's likely he's trying to figure out what he's doing. But with you talking, and I see you guys are um, asking questions, and we'll address some questions. But ending a training session. Yeah. Studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement, it's the animal's preferred form <laughs> yeah. of enrichment. Yeah, I've heard about it <laughs> Yeah, and I, I believe that. True. And yes. other studies also show some of the most complex forms of enrichment are social yes. enrichment, yes. interaction. That is training. Yes, that There's is. There's both of them. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling an animal, you're sitting here delivering all this awesomeness, whether it's attention, treats, what have you, the training itself, you're sitting here delivering all this awesomeness, and all of a sudden you say, you're done. Exactly. You're going to, you're probably going to see several, you can see numerous different things. Right. Um, like here with Rico, if I tell him, you're done, and you turn and try to walk out of that cage, yeah. you're probably going to have a bird biting on the back of your head. Yes, I, and I've noticed that you have like a ritual or a system for leaving, and that oftentimes you're getting involved in another activity before you leave and you'll make sure he's comfortable instead of just, I gotta go. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Um, because even like with Rocky, a lot of his reinforcers are social. So oh, I yeah. ask him to step up when I deliver the interaction, the petting once he steps up. But that if I just pet him real quick and walk away, I will punish the future behavior of him stepping up. Right. right. Because then your reinforcer isn't only interaction, it's period of time. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think with with Rocky, like when he was on my arm, he doesn't want to get off. Right. 
So we're punishing him basically by saying, okay, you're done, get off now. And he's not ready for the interaction to be over yet. On the other hand, there are times when the interaction does have to be over. So you have to reinforce highly the getting off of my arm onto your arm or into the cage so that it doesn't become an aversive, unpleasant thing and you can't get him to move when you want him to move. Yeah. So, and, and he's got choice there because he can just stay where he is. And so we have to work around his preferences. That doesn't mean we just let him stay until he's tired of it, but we have to think about, okay, what can we do now? to help him make the choice we want him to make. Sure, and spot. that's the importance of um, uh, building your list of reinforcers. Right. If you're only relying on food, you're gonna be screwed very <laughs> soon. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I think we're all guilty, or many of us are guilty, of finding food so easy to use as a reinforcer that we don't develop the others, and we don't even notice that we actually have other reinforcers at our disposal all the time, like my attention and like touch and petting and things like that, that we just don't use those much because food works so easily. Yeah. But then it becomes almost like a transaction with the animal. You do this, I give you a piece of food, I paid you. Then where's the relationship part of that? We've lost a lot of value if we just only rely on food and we don't develop the, the social reinforcement yes, that I we can't have agree with you animal. more. Okay. And I think it, that's that's somewhere where we've gone a little off track in positive reinforcement training. That for a lot of people, positive reinforcement is all about what food does my animal want. And that's a small part of the big picture. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say something that I thought was really important. <laughs> we do this a lot. <laughs> we do this all the time. It's like I had a thought and I lost it. It'll come back. Oh. I got it back. Okay. Um, you use any pig people in here? Pig people. That sounds weird. Pig people? Okay. Pig people, are you out there? Pig companion owners, <laughs> caretakers out there. Um, I know Shelly is, but if you, okay, here's a true example and animal that if you're only using food as a reinforcer you're going to get stuck in a hole real quick and that is with a pig okay because the pigs they're so food motivated uh, if yeah. i'm only delivering food as a positive if my only positive reinforcer or the primary is food i am going to likely reinforce or create some type of behavior labeled as aggression Right. You'll see that pig starting to push you into training so he gets more food. Mm -hmm. And behaviors labeled as aggressive are the number one reason I'm contacted by pigs. Yeah. And there's another thing. Let your dog be a dog. Let your bird be a bird. We're bringing these pigs into our homes and trying to change. And they were not developed to be domestic pets. Yeah. 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 There's it, a reason. They yeah. haven't been developed in all these years to be domestic pets in general. While they have a lot of great qualities, and I'm amazed at how fast Milo learns, for example. Yeah. And I love the fact that you can train for food endlessly with him. Yeah. I don't have to live with that. Right. I don't have to live with everything else that goes into that. You know? And of course, people go into every animal without being really educated about what the animal's going to be like once they get it in their house. Sure. And <laughs> that, that is one of the driving forces behind the fund we're getting ready to do for Sam. Right. The Sam I Can Fund, whatever we end up turning that into being, is mm -hmm. it, it's, it's easier to say than do. Educate yourself first. I didn't. No. I didn't with him. We don't. We just um, get the pet. Because yeah. it seems cool, and we like the idea of it. Um, and our vision of what it's going to be like to have an animal is totally different than the reality of living with that animal. Yeah. Same thing is true with you when you have a baby. Trust me. <laughs> your your <laughs> okay, vision of you. life with a baby is not life with a baby. Anybody who's had kids knows this. And it's true for all creatures. It's like, because I, t I tell you all the time, I want a crow. To me, a crow would be like the life achievement animal they're so cool in so many ways luckily i have stepped back and gone wait a minute what would it really be like to spend your life with a crow the requirements of that are too much for my life and too much for what i really want to do with my life 
And I have to accept that. If I just jumped in and got a crow because it would be cool, then I don't think it would end up. Things would not go well for the crow or for me. We would both end up being quite unhappy, even though I love to train and I love that species. So just because I love it and I think it's awesome, that doesn't mean it's going to be a good choice. And that, and we were talking about some of this last night, the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep. <laughs> Which is why I'm drawn to them because of the intelligence. But at the same time, wow. yeah, then I have to challenge that Honestly. intelligence all the time. Yeah. yeah. And that's what people get into with dogs as well. You get a dog that's really, really smart. I have border collies because they are so smart. They learn so fast. They love to train. So they've got a lot of the qualities that I, as a trainer, want to have in my animal. But then... I can't train them 10 minutes a day and ignore them for the other 23 hours and 50 minutes and expect that life is going to be fine. So I have to Why? know about that animal and not just go, oh, I saw one of those YouTube videos with those border collies and they're really smart. I'm going to get me one yeah. because that's going to end badly for the animal and for me. So yeah, With the of, animal likely losing its home. Yeah, exactly, because we didn't learn about them ahead of time. And sometimes we don't, and then we have to learn after the fact. We have to uh, figure it out then as we go along or rehome the animal. And I think that's what we were talking about with Sam a little bit too, is people just don't know what they're getting into. So the animal suffers a lot of deprivation, at least social deprivation, exercise deprivation, whatever the case might Nutritional be. Nutritional deprivation. Yeah, because they really don't know what they're getting into. Um, and then the animal, especially a long-lived animal, like a parrot, Oh my gosh, that's a lot of years to be miserable. And people don't even know they're making them miserable, right? They think they, they're happy in that little cage, eating whatever food that they're giving them. Yeah. And they're not, but they don't know it. And, know? and that's like um, I had said, God forbid something happens to this bird, I am going to be on a mission. Mm -hmm. And I am now on a mission. mission. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's all that can come of, you know, if anything good can come of it. That's I'm so um, redirecting my doing attention. Something in his yeah, in his honor that will help other birds like him. Yeah, that's the best we can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, where do you tackle the root of that problem? Getting to the people. Uh, yeah. I clearly we're not stopping people before they get the birds because mm -hmm. it's too late. Or any animal, right? They've yeah. already done that. Yeah. So the question is now, what can we do to help make everybody's life better? That's our only option now. Right. Because you know, the, 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 the uh, act has already been done. Right. So now right. what? Exactly. And, and I, I would live my life no other way than what I'm living it right now, except for if we were located in Key West. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you and I would just need to pick up and move warmer places, and it would all end up good. Um, but, yeah, but your life is completely focused on these animals, and it has to be. You can't have the animals you have and do what you do without that total focus. So there are a lot of things that other people have in their lives that are important to them and that they need to spend time and energy on that you don't because you've made this your focus. So somebody can't do what you do and have a full-time job and have four kids and volunteer work, whatever. It's like, no, you become, this is the thing. Yeah. I can't do everything that I want. So I have to pick and choose. Here. Right. And, and, and that's why I do what I do to make it easy for the person on the other end of the camera to say, I need help. And I'm like, boom, mm -hmm. here. Yes. Yeah. This, this, Instead this, of this saying, well, why did you do that? You should never have gotten that animal in the first place. Clearly, that was a mistake. Like, that's too late for all that. Yeah. We've got this animal. Yeah. We want to make their lives better. At least that's that's my goal. Make the animal's life better. Um, and I have to say that is what always is? sort of my first goal because I somehow feel more for the animal. I know that I probably should feel more for the human first and then the animal. But I sort of get sucked in with how the animal you know, how the animal's life could be better. But then that makes the human's life better, too. Sure. If we can do things to change all that. Sure. And we um, we were talking. Um, well, I was. <laughs> you um, were talking. I was listening. About, I mean, you're talking about reaching the animal. Um, I was just going to give an example about if I can make that human's life easier, mm -hmm. that animal's likely to keep its home. That's true. 
that's very true. And there's not enough homes for all these animals that need them. Right. And wow, could this conversation go, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. A million different directions. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. We sort of got off on a tangent there a little bit, but I think it's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Go, oh, do we have any questions we want to answer before um, we go into something else? Yeah, anybody, want, anybody have questions? I know... Um, Selfie with the, the jaguar. jaguar got mauled. Um, I'm not sh oh, wow. I'm never sure what people are thinking. That's really not a, a wise selfie decision. Selfie with the jaguar. Imagine that that could go wrong somehow. How could that be bad? <laughs> I took a selfie with Rika or with Rocky yesterday, and I almost lost my phone. But other than that, <laughs> it was great. It's like, think people. They again, they are animals. And There's a reason that they're kept in enclosures sometimes, and. That's probably because you don't want to be in there with them. Correct. And when I'm training, um, when I'm training any animal, because a lot of what I train are, oops, sorry, the exotics, animals that are behind cage bars. Mm -hmm. Whenever I am training an animal behind cage bars, I am always, I want that to be as positive as possible in case for whatever reason those cage bars are never there. Yeah. And yeah. I had that instance. Oh my happened gosh. to me. Oh, I didn't realize that. And it it went it ended well. But I was like, thank God I saved this animal the way I did. Right. And I think if everybody thought like that, then with an animal where there was an accidental face-to-face inter -face interaction, things would probably go okay. But if you're outside the cage bars and you're frustrating the animal, or you're teasing the animal, or you're upsetting the animal. What's going to happen when they get face to face with, oh, them, yeah. with a human being? So you're putting other people in danger because you think it's funny or interesting or you want to provoke a reaction. Where we're totally the other way. It's like I want to make sure if something happens that this animal thinks very kindly about human beings and about me in particular, but about human beings and isn't going to do anything that it wouldn't do if the bars were there. Sure. Because now you've developed that relationship, that form of communication. Right. That right. animal knows when I'm with. I see. I am anthropomorphizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the animal knows right away. Usually, I'd go stop. <laughs> Because then we're like, do we know what the animal actually? Means? Right. <laughs> Very <laughs> funny, right. Rock. It was <laughs> funny. He says, "There's yeah. a there's a history of um, consequences." Mm -hmm. um, antecedents. Yes. Um, right. Uh, and we have to assume that there's some emotional response I don't, on the part of the animal. When we say we don't want to anthropomorphize, that doesn't mean that the animals don't have emotional reactions and responses like humans do, because I think they do have a lot of the same emotions. And ignoring that is a problem. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, just assuming that that's not there is a problem. We're always concerned about how they're feeling as well as what they're doing. And if you ignore that, uh, based on some of the animals, you then you could start reinforcing abnormal repetitive behaviors. Right, right. And, that's and, and then that's behavior. when the person says, the animals just started doing it mm -hmm. for no reason or right. out of nowhere. I right. was like, nope. Not, yeah, it's like, they're usually not out of nowhere. We might have missed a lot of the signs along the way that should have told us something. You know, and I've been as guilty of that as if anybody. Myself as well. Like, you know, hindsight, sure, I should have known that was going to happen, or I should have seen maybe some signs that that was coming. But, you know, that's hindsight. So we learn as we go along. It's like that won't happen again. That won't get by me again if I missed it the first time. Um, and as, an, as a trainer, if I'm not always learning something new, I'm not a very good trainer. Yes. You know, and I'm constantly learning by watching animals, watching other people train animals, watching their interactions. Um, and to me, that's that's what's interesting about this whole this whole field, this whole area. So there's always more to learn. Well, well, we were talking last night, too, about behavior isn't easy. No, it's not. Really? It's it's <laughs> complex. It is. Um, it's not straightforward. It's not if I do this, then my animal will do that. People like that. I have a lot of online students, dog training students, and it's like I wish I could tell you do A three times and your dog will do B, but that's not how this works at all. And it's like okay, the majority of dogs, if you do A three or four times, they're starting to understand that you want B, but then you have the dog because you want Q. You want me to do this, and then we have to go back and figure out what's going on because it is very complex yeah you know? and people don't often realize that a lot of things they're doing are counterproductive 
to some of the things that, that we'd like to um, see happen with animals. He's working with somebody teaching a retrieve. And the dog wouldn't wouldn't take wouldn't put its head in her left hand. We try to get them to put their muzzles in left hand, right hand, and then we work on taking the dumbbell with the retrieve. And the dog wouldn't put its head in her left hand, and then pretty soon stopped wanting to take the dumbbell from her, which was odd because this dog had done just fine up to this point. It's like what's something something's, something's happening. happening. Something's going on. And it turned out that she had been handling something that was noxious to the dog, oh. and she had forgotten about it, and the dog could smell it. And so you're punishing the behavior that you're trying to train. And if she had not thought of that, we would never know why. We would sure. go, wow, that's weird. I don't know why your dog's doing that or not doing that. So the so, key in all behavior serves a purpose. Yes. Yeah, there's a reason they're doing it or not doing it. I'm trying not to give him any attention. <laughs> and I just did. And, he did. and, and, as, and as soon as I looked up there, he stopped and looked like, are you uh, looking at me? Gotcha now. Yeah. Yes, he course. says, now I will do more of that. Well, we've got a couple minutes left, and we haven't touched on care. Yeah. Yes, we, our, our third C, so communication. So defining <laughs> care, whether that's veterinary, <laughs> a prep. Uh, mm -hmm. grooming, yes. uh, exercise, <laughs> however you want to define care. Right, I kind of use, I use the term husbandry just as a general term for anything that's that's <laughs> typically for the animal's physical well-being. So anything I might have to do to or with an animal is care. And um, I have been very much interested in this idea of cooperative care, which goes back to choice. The animal has a choice to participate in their care or not. And if they don't want to participate, again, that tells me something. Right? That tells me that um, I need to change what I'm doing in some way. So I will do my shameless self-promotion. Somebody told me go. I'm like, shameless self-promotion. I'm like, I'm old enough to do shameless self-promotion. You, you go right ahead. Let me see if I can get the book up here. Is it okay? Is it okay? okay. So this here, is let's get it up there a little closer. I'll let you do that. This is my book that just came out January 1st, Cooperative Care, Seven Steps to Stress-Free Husbandry. You can get it on Amazon if you search, search Cooperative Care Deborah Jones. It will come up. I'm very, very proud of this book. Um, this is the 12th book that I have written on animal training and hopefully the last <laughs> because what, writing books is hard. It's very difficult in a long-term lack of reinforcement for years. Um, but I'm happy with this one. So it's written specifically for dogs um, because that's what I was working with. That's what I work with mainly now are people who are training dogs. So, but the, the principles are the same. Sure. I do the same exact thing with my cat. And my cat is marvelous about cooperative care. So those of you who think you can't train a cat, um, you're wrong. Yes, and my correct. cat got, had a, a terrible tail injury, needed a ton of vet care. And I was so thankful that I had done all this work before him because he was fabulous, even in pain. He was fabulous for everybody who handled him. And it's these are the kind of things with husbandry that you need to do ahead of time. Do it before your animal is stressed and in pain. So teaching them to be handled, teaching them to take out of a syringe whatever you might give them, teaching my dogs to swallow them, swallow pills so yeah. that I don't have to try to shove it down your throat. Of course, at my house, you drop something and go, oops. And there you go. Yeah. But you got to make sure the right dog gets it. Um, but all of those things we could be doing. And I know you do a lot of that. And I actually mention you in the book. So that You I do? I do. You haven't read it yet. I just gave it to you. I just got in the it. acknowledgments, I mentioned Laura as being one of my inspirations. Oh, Deb, are you serious? That because is so awesome. when I first came here, it got me thinking about the fact that you're doing a lot of that kind of work with your animals all the time. And we sort of ignore that with dogs. And we just drag them to the vet and say, you know, let's restrain them and do whatever we have to do. When in reality, we could be doing a lot to make it better. So you're one of my first inspirations. Well, thank that. you. Thank you. Welcome. That's an honor. And, and um, what I was going to say is that's what we do in our live streams, especially in level two, which is for professional trainers, um, zoo trainers, what have you, people mm -hmm. wanting to know more about applied behavior analysis. And level in two. level two is fun. You should join us. <laughs> and in the parrot project I mean I'm always training animals here for um, when you're sick that came in that was so oh, crucial to Sam that yes. I had already 
I mean, he'd already learned the syringe. Mm -hmm. I didn't get enough. I only had six months with him. Yeah, and we got so far. But then when he's sick, when, um, when Rico was sick, I can't tell you. I mean, there's so many times last week. Hey, Sandy. Mm -hmm. There were so many times last week with Sam that I was like, Thank God I had already trained this because if I didn't, your life would be so much more stressful right, right now. Exactly. If they're used to that, I always say, I want my animals to think this is just another weird thing. You know, it's just another strange thing we do when I grab you and pinch you a little bit and, you know, whatever the case might be, or stick my hands in your mouth. That this is just the weird dust, and it happens. So by the time you get to the point where they are sick and they really need it, they're like, oh, at least they understand what it is. Sure. And they don't, they don't panic. They don't fight that. And or don't help get them. as stressed. Right. Exactly. It may still not be pleasant. Because I know if I'm sick, I don't want somebody like sticking something in my mouth. I'd bite them too. Sure. You know, yeah. right away. I would, I would be a terrible, terrible animal because I would bite them immediately. But if I was used to that as a game, at least I would be familiar with it. It's when we don't do any of these things. And then we go, oh, well, here you go. By the way, I'm going to get three people to restrain you. And we're going to do something painful to you. Whereas if my animal knows, oh, this happens. And it could be a lot more about understanding. Right. I know the consequence of this yeah. behavior. Yeah, sort of back to communication. Kind of circles back to communication again. We've already given them a lot of information about these things that might have to happen. And that's then they're not panic because they understand us we've communicated that this is normal this yep. is what happens so yep. yeah i think that's an important thing that a lot of animal pet owners of all pets ignore yes. until there's until it's an emergency and i can't tell you how many people have said to me well you know i need to, my dog needs eye drops like okay now we're going to have a problem because they need them now and you have not prepared them for it whereas if you can prepare them and yeah, it's a thing it's an easier thing yeah. Well, with that being said, it's already 10.01. Oh, my gosh. Let's talk fast. about, uh, real quick, um, do you want to talk about where people can, I'm going to put up your website and oh, okay. your, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about um, any of the classes, webinars. Oh, okay. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can always check out my website. I think you might yep, have got it, it here somewhere on canineinfocus.com. Um, that has all the information about you know, what I'm doing. I do a lot of teaching through Frenzy Dog Sports Academy. It's an online school. And I actually, in April, I'm starting a class on cooperative care. It's a um, very general class that get, introduces animals to all the basics of care. Can you have, mostly it's dogs. I'm very happy to have any other species. I've had a parrot. I've yeah. had um, I've had cats, had a bunny, um, and I've had a um, stabby puppy. Uh, you've had a porcupine? <laughs> yes, there is a porcupine. <laughs> a stabby puppy. puppy. So I'm very happy to see other species and we can always work to alter things for that particular species. So the class is set up basically for dogs, but the cooperative care class, so, so that goes along with what we're talking about um, quite a bit, I think. So, and you can always email me, deb at canineinfocus.com, um, and I will respond. If I don't, your email may have gone into spam, so try again, because I remember about every three weeks to check spam and see if there's anything in there that I might actually be a real thing. Um, so feel free if you have any questions about any of that kind of thing. Um, I think that's about it. We're working on the October event. Yeah, I think you're going to talk about that. Sure. Let's move into that. Um, well, and I didn't even put my own website up there. <laughs> um, well, but they'll, they'll find you. If you, you know. want to reach me, you can re our website is uh, the T H E Animal Behavior Center at gmail.com. If you want to reach me personally, my email address is Laura at the Animal Behavior Center dot com. Um, in closing, we're going to go into what we have coming up. Um, the second, second, second. Now it's an annual thing. Yes, because it's more than one. <laughs> yes, um, the All Species Animal Training and Behavior Workshop. It's going to be the second weekend in October of this year, 2019, October 12th and 13th. It's going to be Deb and I. Um, and it's usually beautiful weather that time of year here. Not too hot, not too cold. Yep. And a nice time to be, if you've got to be in Ohio, it's a nice time to be in Ohio. Yep. 
So in its um, lecture, a lot of uh, hands-on training, a lot of group training, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of wa some of watching us train. Right. It's really interactive. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, there's lots of discussion. There's lots of people getting to do hands-on stuff and ask questions. And we had fabulous reviews after was, the one last year. It was a year. good one. They're the funniest part to me is the axolotls. <laughs> I'll, I'll never get over the axolotls. <laughs> I've seen Laura interact with a lot of animals. And the axolotls, which are these little tiny fishy reptilian things, which they can't hurt you. And she's they can they make her very nervous, which cracks me up. Yes, they can <laughs> attach to your ear and no, stuff they, your brain. They're off. not aliens. <laughs> <laughs> they are not. They are adorable. And everybody got a chance to train those. And that, and that was, was fun. a lot of fun. Because so. we tried to pick an animal that nobody had trained before. Right. An axolotl. Exactly. There and you go. Where do you start? How, and we started with identifying most motivation, how to create or it, how to reinforce them yep. appropriately. That in itself was hard. Is you know just figuring out how to supply and reinforcers. You better figure that out pretty quick, or you could punish the very behavior you're trying happen. to trigger. Yeah, I think that did happen. That we ran into that. Yep. So. That was cool. some pretty eye-opening information. Yeah, that was fun. So reserve your seat spot. Reserve your spot now because they are limited and they have already started selling. Right. So if you guys like some of which, I mean, some of the different services I offer, my live streaming um, services, they're annual. I offer them to people all over the world. Level one, companion animal. Level two, uh, people that are professional trainers or wanting to know more about using applied behavior analysis mm -hmm. and animals, um, an array of animals. Um, and then the parrot project, which is super successful. It's all species specific live streaming about parrots. Um, the, I think April 27th, we're having a pet tutor workshop here at the Animal Behavior Center. If you're interested, email me. We're also going to be live streaming that for our memberships. And then also our email newsletter you can always sign up for. And I like to tell you I send that out every week, but I send it out when I remember. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me laugh because that sounds just like you. <laughs> so with that being said, thanks, Deb, for coming on again. You know I'll come anytime you invite me. Yeah. You always have a good time. Well, we're going to head to breakfast. And so, um, yes, I have something I'm going to talk to Deb about. Uh-oh. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so, everybody. I love being here. It's so nice to see you all. Thanks for coming back, Deb. Anytime. All right. See you guys.